I'm Dr. Daniel Alterman, a vascular surgeon. The topic of this webcast is claudication. Claudication is a typical symptom that prompts referral to vascular specialists or a vascular surgeon. The term is derived from a Latin root word meaning to limp. It typically describes an exertional fatigue, which is heaviness or cramping of the buttock, thigh, or calf that is usually related to diminished blood flow or some upstream narrowing. The process of diagnosing it, treating it, is often very stressful for patients. Most people I see with claudication have a variety of misconceptions. Many people are concerned they're going to end up with an amputation or are under the impression that they need to be rushed for a bypass. Typically, neither of these are the case. The disease process of claudication typically involves narrowing of a peripheral vessel. This produces a choke point which restricts flow. Oftentimes with mild claudication, the flow is relatively normal at rest, but only under periods of exertion and activity when there should be an increased flow to match the demand, the supply is inadequate. This supply demand mismatch produces muscular fatigue, buildup of lactic acid, and the heaviness and pain that's associated with claudication. The diagnosis of claudication often leads to a label of PAD. The terms peripheral arterial disease and peripheral vascular disease have been used interchangeably and describes the disease process and is really a waste basket term. Peripheral vascular disease generally refers to blockages of arteries outside of the heart. This can encompass disease of the carotid artery, subclavian artery, aortoiliac disease, and popliteal artery as well. This is a common condition and about 10 million Americans are affected. The prevalence of the disease increases as people get older and with typical risk factors such as a Western, Western diet and cigarette smoking. Of more importance, the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease, particularly when it's severe, can signal a high concurrence of coronary artery disease. At least a third of patients with very severe peripheral vascular disease also have significant coronary artery disease, and this is usually the Achilles heel of the disease in that it produces an increased risk of early morbidity or mortality. Several multidisciplinary groups have created extensive guidelines. The purpose of this webcast is not to review these in detail, but to give a broad overview and patient-oriented uh, expectations. The risk factors for peripheral arterial disease are what I like to refer to as the usual suspects. These are the common players that are present in the history of someone who has severe PAD. Most commonly, this is cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, disorders of cholesterol. Uh, also, there's many subtypes of disordered lipid transport. Other risk factors include a family history of peripheral arterial disease, obesity, disordered homocysteine, uh, renal disease, and age. Some of these are not modifiable, but some of them are obviously uh, modifiable and can be improved, such as curtailing the volume of cigarette smoking. There is in several populations of people that are at an increased risk for the development of peripheral arterial disease. With age greater than 65 and an American diet, this is one known risk. Uh, in persons between the age of 50 and 64, there is a higher occurrence of PAD with a history of smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, disorders of cholesterol, and family history of peripheral arterial disease. In younger patients, it typically affects those who have diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and cigarette smoking. Typical symptoms of peripheral arterial disease include weakness, heaviness, exertional fatigue. Signs can include loss of hair on the toes, a weak peripheral pulse, coolness of the extremities. Very severe manifestations include rest pain, 
non-healing wounds, even progression to ulceration and frank gangrene, when someone has the more severe symptoms, they're really out of the realm of claudication and into the classification of what's referred to as critical limb ischemia. This heralds a much more aggressive disease course and usually prompts more aggressive treatment as well. When someone progresses to breast pain and tissue loss, the risk of cardiovascular mortality and complications is higher, and this includes risks of limb loss, heart attack, stroke, and death. The initial triage of PAD is often done by measurement of an ankle brachial index. This refers to the ratio of the blood pressure around the arm and the ankle. For most people, this number should be about one or even. In some situations where the vessels are very calcified, such as with diabetes or chronic kidney disease, this measurement is not accurate because the ankle pressures are falsely elevated. For most people with mild claudication, the ankle brachial index at rest is going to be in the neighborhood of 0.8 to 0.9. When it gets very severe, this ratio often declines to 0.4. When it's less than this value, it can be associated with more severe symptoms. It's very important that patients know what their ankle brachial index is, how it changes over time, and how various treatments affect it. This can help inform the disease prognosis and decisions as to whether any changes in treatment are needed. There are several classification schemes for peripheral vascular disease. The Rutherford Clinical Score is one of the more common ones that is still in clinical and research use. Stages 4, 5, and 6 do refer to the more severe symptoms, such as rest pain or tissue loss, and this is really beyond the scope of mild PAD or claudication. The biology of atherosclerosis is complex and only partially understood. There are many cytokine mediators. It is clearly an inflammatory disease, and the migration of smooth muscle cells has been thought to be a key mediator of it. The question often becomes as to what the future holds with claudication. A very important concept that I often discuss with patients up front who have mild claudication is that the odds of them progressing to critical limb ischemia is small. The five-year natural history includes only a 1-2% to 2 progression to risk of limb loss. About 15-30% to 30 of patients will get worse, and up to a quarter of patients will experience some major cardiovascular event, such as heart attack or stroke. Typically, the atherosclerotic risk factors point towards uh, a higher risk factor for heart attack rather than limb threat, which is often uh, the focus. There are several conditions that can mimic peripheral vascular disease or claudication. Most commonly, this is problems of the musculoskeletal uh, system, such as spinal claudication. This has been referred to as pseudoclaudication. As the sacral foramina become impinged, this produces pain that radiates down the leg and with ambulation. Oftentimes, this is relieved by leaning over, and many patients will say, well, my legs hurt, but when I lean on the shopping cart, I can go forever, and this points towards a diagnosis of pseudoclaudication. Radiculopathy or sciatica can mimic PAD. Pain in the hip or knee joint, such as osteoarthritis and degenerative disease, can cause exertional discomfort. Problems with the nerves, such as neuropathy, uh, this is frequent in diabetes and side effects of chemotherapy. This can often be teased out, though, by clinical exam and history. There is a condition referred to as venous claudication, particularly if someone has obstructed veins, this can produce very similar symptoms, but the skin manifestations are often different. There are some patients that do get typical PAD, but don't have the common risk factors. This can be due to very severe genetics or family history. Occasionally, it's due to anatomic abnormality, such as the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. The treatment of claudication is really a Pandora's box. There is a variety of medical therapies, 
that can both modify the disease course, can reduce the risk factors of cardiovascular events, and can improve blood flow. One of the key concepts I emphasize to patients is that atherosclerosis is not curable. Oftentimes, patients view a uh, blocked artery as almost like a broken bone. Once it's fixed, well, it's the, the situation is settled and it's cured. In general, peripheral arterial disease and atherosclerosis is not curable. The analogy I like to use is that it's similar to cancer. We can treat the symptoms, we can put it into remission, but it is a lifelong process. Treatment for peripheral vascular disease often begins with an assessment of risk factors and ensuring that they are appropriately controlled and that someone is on what is referred to as best medical therapy. The American Heart Association and the Society of Vascular Surgery have published guidelines which describe treatment goals for clinical parameters such as the blood pressure, lipid profile, and hemoglobin A1C for diabetics. Some of the key components for best medical therapy include stopping smoking, controlling diabetes when present, being on appro appropriate antiplatelet therapy, making sure that cholesterol goals are achieved, and blood pressure goals as well. Diet and exercise does have a very important role. One of the main uh, non-pharmacologic treatments for PAD involves structured walking and exercise. Many patients cannot tolerate this either due to the severity of their PAD or associated cardiopulmonary disease. However, for younger patients, it's a very important part of therapy. Other treatments, in addition to best medical therapy, include restoration of blood flow. Oftentimes, this does a, a huge part in relieving the severe symptoms. Like the disease course of atherosclerosis and the ongoing management, it also requires monitoring. Oftentimes, I emphasize to patients that any treatment for claudication is putting the disease into remission and is not curative. There are some alternative therapies which have been investigated with variable success. These include historical treatments like lumbar sympathectomy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, pneumatic compression, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Systematic Cochrane reviews of these treatments have indicated many of them uh, do not have level one evidence, but for certain patient populations, they should be considered. Components of revascularization or improving blood flow often include, in addition to the non-surgical treatments of medical therapy and exercise, invasive treatments like angioplasty, stenting, atherectomy or plaque cleaning out, endarterectomy or bypass. Angioplasty was one of the earliest treatments for occluded arteries. This refers to a mechanical dilation or compression of a diseased vessel. This oftentimes improves blood flow immediately. Angioplasty does have limitations as there can be significant recoil or if the volume of disease is large with heavily calcified vessels, oftentimes angioplasty has a limited effect. Stenting was the next logical step to try to provide a buttress or support to a collapsed or narrowed artery. Oftentimes this is done with titanium or some type of nickel alloy. Steel has been used as well and is often a component in the industrial manufacturing of stents. Stents provide a scaffold and support. Uh, like other types of invasive treatments, they are not curative and do have failure points. Stents can collapse over time, and the interstices of stents can be affected by regrowth of plaque, what's referred to as intimal hyperplasia, or even recurrence of the atherosclerosis. Atherectomy refers to a minimally invasive plaque cleaning out. There are several tools on the U.S. market which can percutaneously rotor rooter or clean out plaque. Oftentimes, these are adjuncts but have the same limitations as other uh, surgical therapies. Endarterectomy refers to a plaque cleaning out. This is often very effective in locations such as the carotid artery or femoral artery. It is invasive, does have risks, and the treatment plan should be individualized. 
Complete restoration of flow is often possible or necessary when the symptoms become very severe or progress to risk of limb loss. Typically, this is done with bypass. There's a variety of types of bypass and conduits that can be used. The oldest and most common one remains the greater saphenous vein. For a femoral blockage, this typically involves a femoral popliteal bypass. Claudication is important because the symptoms are often very severe and can progress to be either lifestyle limiting or threatening the limb itself. The other reason claudication is important to diagnose and treat is that it signifies significant cardiovascular risk. Oftentimes, the initial evaluation of claudication needs to focus on identifying underlying risk factors and correcting them and controlling them. The other important manifestation of claudication is disease progression. About a third of patients do progress over five years with worse symptoms, and a very small percentage can progress severely so to limb threat. The biggest thing I explain to patients when I first meet them to discuss claudication diagnosis and PAD is that it's a big sign that your body is not happy and that changes need to be made. For most of the patients with claudication, this involves stopping smoking. The other risk factors as described. The other thing that needs to be emphasized is that PAD and claudication is a chronic disease. Any treatment, whether it's medical or surgical, has a recurrence and potential failure rate, and it's going to require lifelong attention. The best way to approach a complex and dynamic condition like claudication and PAD is to individualize it. Oftentimes, this is best carried out with thoughtful consideration of treatment and multidisciplinary approach.